it, it became something that my wife and I had to have a discussion about when we realized how much this was growing in terms of people responding and, and becoming a part, and even people expressing themselves in their own ways under the banner of this flag. And I sat down with my wife and I, the first thing I did was to apologize for doing something that I knew was going to be a danger, not only to myself, but to my family. Her response for me, even up to now, is a reassurance that sometimes in marriage you have someone who is not just a wife but someone who is a life partner. And my wife looked at me and she said, I've known you for 13 years as a husband, a little bit longer because we dated for two years prior, we got married. And she said to me, the one thing that I've always known about you is that you're a starter of things. And I knew at one point that you would start something that would catch fire and cause a blaze. So I'm not surprised. My only concern is for your safety. Me and the kids will always be okay. And so that was the discussion we had. I remember I said to her, I'm going to purposefully leave you out of a lot of things that I do and say so that you are genuinely in the dark about what I'm doing. If ever you have to be questioned, if ever you have to be pressured into revealing information about what I am doing, I want you to genuinely, genuinely say I don't know and that actually be the truth. And so that was our arrangement and still remains our arrangement even up to now. Um, given you only found out about the more serious charges when you got to court, I believe, uh, was your wife there? How did you feel about the enormity of what you were now facing? I've, n I've never been in a courtroom before, but in my mind it had always played out quite simply and straightforward. You're charged with something, you go before a magistrate, and the charges are brought before you. Do you deny or do you accept? The defense and, 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 uh, and the prosecution present their cases. And the magistrate rules. Everyone goes home either with bail or without bail. It's done. On this day, it, something was so different because when we got to the courthouse, maybe about 11 o'clock, which was, again, almost three hours late, there was a sense that there's something going on behind the scenes that I don't know about. It took so long. By the time I stood before the magistrate, it, it was since 11 in the morning after arriving, I stood before the magistrate maybe about 5, 6 p.m. And at that point, I knew something was afoot. I just didn't know what it was. When the charges came out, the new charges came out, and I found out about them as I stood in the dock, my heart sank. And the first thought that came to my mind was, oh, my God, what have I done to my children? What have I done? What, what, have I, what, what, have I, what have I, what have I done to my family? <laughs> my, uh, my, my lawyer came and, um, and told me and said to me, uh, listen, these are serious charges. This is not a joke. we may have to go to the high court for this, to apply for bail for this charge. I said to him, what charge are you talking about? And he read it out to me and he says, plotting to, to subvert a constitutionally elected government. I, I was shocked. I could not believe it. I looked at him. I said to him, what does it mean? And he says, it means that you could be gone for a long time, my friend. And so he said to me, I need you to make the call. Do we ask the magistrate to close this and we deal with it tomorrow? Or do we go for it now? So I looked at him and I said, sir, I don't want to spend another night away from my family. I don't want to give a chance for anything more to be leveled against me than the truth. Let's deal with it now. And so that was that moment. It was, it's a moment in which I heard a thousand voices in one second. I, it's a moment in which I heard hundreds of thousands of people saying, we told you so. You, th you thought you were smart. It's a moment in which I heard a handful of people saying, this is what it takes to make a difference. 
the biggest miracle was not my release. The biggest miracle were the people of Zimbabwe. For a few hours in our entire history, I saw people stand up to injustice, to ruthlessness, and tell them you will never do this to us again. They, those people have it in them. They have a fight in them that this government has never seen, and their day is coming. They could shut us up. They could lock me up. They could kill me. But the citizens of Zimbabwe are coming for their freedom. I'm, a, I'm the lucky one. I got out. There's a lot who died who didn't make it. The many who got beaten, they disappeared. People don't know where they are. Those people are my heroes. I'm glad I got out to tell the story. I'm so glad I am. It's, it's a tool they've used for, for a long time, the fear and the intimidation. And they'll use it. And it's up to Zimbabweans to decide whether we've come to that place where indeed enough is enough. And where we decide that with our lives we are possibly now having to pay for a freedom that was already paid for. You're, we're going to have to settle a bill that was already settled. And someone asked me a couple of days ago and said, at what cost are you wanting this new Zimbabwe, this new season? And I said, when we called a stay away a couple of weeks ago and everybody stayed away, every Zimbabwean paid. They paid with their daily wage. They paid with the food that they were supposed to eat that day. They paid with the school fees of the children that they were supposed to get that day. And I think because of that, because of that action, I think Zimbabweans are ready to pay the ultimate price. It can't be stopped. Even if, 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 if we were deemed a failure in the next couple of months, or even when the elections came, nothing happened. There is one thing that will always haunt this government, that the citizens are alive and that they are watching.